the purpose of what we're going to talk about is is surviving in the case that we have a, uh, uh, a an aircraft crash. So we're not trying to teach you how to build a shelter or be bear grills or anything like that. You're not going to be a snake eater like uh, Captain Mulligan was and so forth. It's more focused on how to get out of the aircraft, how to be safe, and a couple of simple things to do. Uh, part of what you need to do is know that there are land survival courses that you can take elsewhere. And the other part is that we have the water survival class. And the water survival class is something that you can do and we're going to set up sometime in the near future. So those are things to do. Uh, I think I talked about that the other day. Okay, so our objectives are to discuss basic post-crash actions. What do you do? How do you get out of the airplane and so forth? Uh, we're going to look at survival equipment and discuss a couple of things, particularly how important water signaling devices and basic survival equipment in during the course of the slides, you will see some different uh, items and some things to carry. So we'll look at those. It's a good idea if you're going to be air crew to have some kind of survival kit that you can wear on your person during the time you're in the aircraft. Quite often, if you need to evacuate an aircraft quickly, you don't have time to be fumbling around and there are doors and hatches and things that could be locked shut. So you want to be able to get out of the airplane and you've got everything that you need to, to be successful. And then last, we'll look at uh, urgent care and talk about moving victims, airway, the, the basics, uh, airway, breathing, bleeding, post-care directions. Okay, so post-crash actions. Let's, let's talk about what happens after the crash and somewhat before, but okay. Keep in mind that the most important survival tool you have is attitude, and I'll add one other thing to that is training. If you don't think you're going to make it, you really cut your odds of making it. Being prepared takes a lot of mental pressure off and gives you the confidence to know that you can handle the situation. So your training and will build your attitude, and your attitude is what, <clears throat> which, which will carry you through in dealing with whatever circumstances that you have going on at the time. Okay, so positive mental attitude, I already talked about it. That's the difference between life and death. Not to be over dramatic about it, but if you if you know you've got some skills and you you've got just some chops, uh, it puts you in a much better position to uh, take care of yourself. Okay, so to be prepared. The Boy Scouts are always saying be prepared. CAP is saying always saying semper vigilance, which is always vigilant. So to be prepared you need to carry a survival kit, and I touched on that. You also need to know what's in the kit. Just to have a kit and go, yeah, well, there's a survival kit, and don't know what's in it or how to use what's in it is, is not a good idea. You also need to inspect your, your contents periodically. I used to work for a company called Cintas, and it was quite common for us to sell a trauma kit to some of the hotels for the security department and they would have get a kit two years ago and there are items in it that they haven't looked at, inspected, and they're all beat up and whatnot after two years, things expire. So you need to be aware of that. Go through it periodically and make sure that everything you've got is up to date, it's serviceable and so forth. I don't know who Rhoda is, but if you can't walk from the end of the runway to the terminal without getting cold, then you're not dressed properly. And that addresses a problem that we have here in Hawaii and often other places too, like in Florida where I lived previously. Part of that is it's a sunny day. We're leaving Kalalui. We're going to fly down to Hana. And so we're wearing flip-flops or slippers and a tank top and, and shorts. And we wind up having to make an off-airport landing in a lava field or something our odds of doing it successfully, getting out of there uh, and being able to get around self-rescue and so forth are pretty slim because we're not equipped for it. That's one of the reasons we wear light suits for fire protection. Also, it's sun protection, abrasion protection. 
and we wear boots and closed-toed shoes that are tied on uh, with laces. If you're in the north, in New Jersey, New York, Alaska, any of the colder states, you want to make sure that you bring appropriate clothing and supplies that you can use to, uh, in the event that you do have an off-airport landing, whether it's a crash or just a emergency landing. So dress properly for the environment, not only your departing and arriving in, but what's in between. If you're flying over mountainous area, like going from Montana to LA, you might not want to be down on the ground five, six, eight, ten days in slippers and a tank top. So get the right stuff. And we touched on that with the worst conditions we were flying over. And your cell phone, if you were look at the uh, new CAP publication, Props, there was a lot of, kind of information about a new technique. It's not new, it's like 10 years old, but CAP has developed a high degree of ex expertise in doing what they call cell phone forensics. And they recently found a, I think it was a hiker who was lost in the woods, wasn't terribly serious, but they were able to find this person in a couple of hours by pinging their cell phone and figuring out where they had been. So that's a very valuable thing. Cell phone is communication and signaling, and that's very important to have with you. So always charge your phone up, and uh, if you got backup batteries for it, that's a great thing to have. Uh, if you have to use it, conserve the use of the phone. They can still ping it even though you're not transmitting or receiving. Hey, Chaz, can I add something there? Yeah. Sure. Uh, and that is uh, the, the current regulations by the FCC say that you're not supposed to operate a cell phone in the airplane. In fact, it's supposed to be in the airplane mode, which basically turns it off <clears throat> as far as transmitting and receiving. Our recommendation, pretty wide within CAP, is to not follow that, uh, that guidance and in fact, to leave your cell phone on. And the reason uh, being is exactly what Chaz was talking about, the cell phone forensic. They can pinpoint where you are very closely uh, using uh, the pings off the different towers. And, and also your phone, most phones have internal GPS. So it's reporting what its position is. So uh, I highly recommend uh, leaving your cell phone on. Uh, you can put it in uh, sleep mode or something like that. Uh, so it doesn't ring. Uh, but it's still uh, responding to the uh, pings and allows people to figure out where you are if you don't end up at your destination as a program. It's, it's an excellent backup device. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about personal locator devices, which are basically uh, personalized ELTs, and those are valuable to have, and I believe those are standard in our, our life vest. Is that correct? Yes, every life vest has a ELB. So we always have them with us, which is another reason, even if you're not flying over water, to wear the life vest because you have some survival items, signaling items in that itself. We talked about prior preparation being important, but it begins before you leave the ground on every sortie. So it's important that you know how to exit the aircraft in the event that it's necessary. When we talked about ground operations, I kind of skipped over this, but one of the things that should happen with every flight is before departure, there should be a, um, a mission briefing and there should also be a passenger briefing that the pilot gives. And the passenger briefing will tell you, make sure that you know how to operate seat belts and how to get out of the aircraft and so on. When you're getting out of the airplane, we have a specific way of doing it. If before the airplane, let's assume it's going to be an off airport landing, other than a gentle one, that we always open the doors first and latch them open so that they don't get twisted and locked up on us. The next thing is, once we're on the ground and the aircraft is, is stopped moving, you want to exit the aircraft. And the way that's done is the pilot and observer or co-pilot they bring that out. Now you'll notice here that the scanners exit through the right door in an aircraft called the mall. The pilots enter or exit through, wait, this is backwards. Oh, that's in a mall. Normally what we do is the pilot and the passenger 
go out the right-hand side of the, of the doors. They pull the seats forward, they get out that way. The people in the back seat come out the left side of the door, and in the event that you're using a, doing a water landing, somebody always is going to be responsible for grabbing the life raft and taking it with them. Obviously, if you're wearing flotation devices, do not inflate them while you're in the aircraft, particularly if you're in the water. That's not a good thing to do. Yeah, that, that slide is kind of confusing. Is there a slide for like the Cessna 172 or 182? Yeah. Um, so the one, the arrows with the little diamonds at the end of them, uh, where the feathers would be, ignore those. Those are not for the aircraft that we fly. So basically, the pilot right. runs his seat all the way forward. Right. The, the co-pilot runs his seat all the way back. And the two front seats right. go out the right side. Right. And the uh, two rear seat occupants go out the left side. Correct. I touched on this a little bit. Uh, once you're clear of the aircraft, and we've already uh, egressed from the aircraft, you want to make sure that there, if there's any danger of fire or uh, something that co could cause you to fall down a, a cliff or a precipice. You want to make sure that you're looking for that before you go. You want to check everybody for injuries and apply first aid. So basic first aid, and that's one of the requirements for ground team membership and I think it would be a very prudent thing as a part of an air crew that everybody in the air crew have first aid experience and training and refresh it periodically. Pilots are required to do a biennial flight review and it would be not a bad idea to go over your basic first aid information. Uh, also learn about AEDs so that you can use this in the event that you, you're in a circumstance where you need to deal with the injuries. One of the ways you want to prevent shock, which is almost happens almost all the time after a uh, traumatic incident, is by sipping water. So it's a good idea to carry water in the aircraft. And there's another reason we'll get to later about dehydration and altitude, but to have water or something like that to drink. Okay, moving on, activate the ELT. If the aircraft ELT has an ELT, which it likely it will in CAP, activate it if, and double check to make sure that it is activated. Uh, you may not be able to access it because of the damage to the airframe, so you'll just have to take a shot with that. If you have the life vest on or you can get to a life vest, you can always use personal locator beacon that's in the life jacket. Uh, instead of the ELT. We talked about cell phone and uh, radio. If the aircraft is in, intact enough and there's no hazard of fire or anything like that, possibly that would work too and you can get out a distress call. Whatever you do, stay in the aircraft area. It's really, really hard, as you'll find out, to find a survivor walking away out in the woods. Even like it's a lava field or it's low scrub or whatever, you're really, really, really hard to find. And uh, when you go on your, uh, your, your training missions, uh, your pilot's probably gonna fly over something like an area with cattle or deer or something like that, and you'll see how difficult it is. So stay with the airplane. That's what everybody's looking for, particularly if you're in a remote area. And then finally, consider water, shelter, and food. Those are the, the primary things that you need. Water, primary importance. Shelter, yeah, food, you can go out without food for a while. But it's a good idea in your survival jacket or whatever your, your packing is to have some granola bars, some power bars, something like that to sustain you for a while. Some beef jerky would work and it's light, it's small, it's compact, it doesn't spoil, and it can take you a long way in dire circumstances. Okay, so on the left side, you can see the jacket type that I use. The Air Force used, uh, Colonel Denison can address this more readily than I, but I think that's probably the, they don't wear jackets like that anymore, but that was probably current when you were actively flying. Is that right, sir? Uh, not exactly like that one, but quite similar. You know, it's a mesh and has a lot of pockets on it and so forth. Uh, that looks like a, like a civilian version, but it's quite similar. We also had a holster on it to carry a, a weapon. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> there there are a number of them. There's one that uh, I I was able to get that company's out of manufacture, but there are if you go online, you can go to companies that sell uh, hunting vests and fishing vests and that kind of thing. Another alternative is a backpack, as illustrated. Backpacks, they they ain't on you when you're in the airplane. So if you need to skedaddle, I want it on my body. Uh, If I can get out, it's going with me. There are packets of water that you can get. They're like, I think, an ounce, maybe four ounces or something like that. Uh, Real important to have. And in the back of the uh, vest that I wear, which is shown on the left, there's a slotted area. It's kind of like the pouch on the backpack. You can get bags. They're like giant baggies. And you can use that for water collection, fire stuff. There are a lot of things you can do with it. But that's something to have with you because you may not, you won't probably have a canteen. But if you can find a water source, you can collect water and go from there. The picture on the right is somebody using a sanitizing, it's like a straw that you can uh, decontaminate and sanitize water from a stream because you may not have ability to uh, boil water or do purification. So in your survival kit, it'd be a good idea to have maybe some purification tablets. You can get those from survival stores, sporting goods stores, and so forth. Okay, signaling is the majority of what the military has in their and their survival vest. Fire making and signaling. The fire making is a signal, so the two go together. We talked about ELTs and PLBs, a tarp, a lightweight tarp. Uh, space blankets are good. They're kind of flimsy, but they help. A uh, signal mirror, you can hand, you can make a signal mirror uh, using an old CD, because uh, they got a shiny side, you can use that. But you can also purchase signal mirrors like the illustration on the left-hand side. and what the the receiver of the signal will see is something like what you see in the middle. And then on the right side is the uh, uh, the PLB, which is in our life vest. Pyrotechnic flares and smoke. I uh, believe we have uh, pyrotechnic flares in the life jackets. Is that correct? We do, yes. And the signal mirror. Signaling is the biggest thing because people are going to come looking for you, either because of the cell phone forensics or the PLB or the ELT or something, they're going to be looking for you. And when they're looking, make it easy for them. (laughs) The faster they can see your signal, the faster they get help to you. You can make your own signal using a class acronym. So think in terms of make it brightly colored or something that wouldn't appear in nature, like lime green or yellow or Uh, what they used to call international orange. Put it where it can be seen. High is good. Use things that make angles. In nature, there are no angles. Things are curved. They're convoluted. But specific angles are definitely man-made. So they'll draw attention. So you want to make things large and visible and non-blend inable, if you can say that, uh, with the, the normal environment that's on the ground. And make them eye-catching. If you keep that in mind, what color is it? Where do you put it? Make sure it doesn't blend in so it doesn't occur in nature. Make it big so it's visible from the air. And make it eye-catching. You could do like a Mount Rushmore of my face. That would be eye-catching. It would probably make the searchers sick on seeing it, but at least they'd know somebody was down there and it was certainly not a nature-based object. That was supposed to be humor. That was supposed to get a laugh. Go, ha, ha, ha. Okay. You guys are a tough audience. Okay. During the pilot briefing, everybody should know where the ELT is located and how to work it, uh, if it's accessible. And it's a good idea to have a small survival manual with you. There are a number of them you can get. You can get copies from Army, Navy stores, and on the internet, uh, stuff that the military, the Air Force, Special Forces, uh, uh, the Navy, the Coast Guard put out. And then there are just regular civilian survival things that are really good. So you can do some research and find those things, and hopefully that'll help you out. But it's a good idea to have something with you because you may not remember what your training was unless you're like that first guy who was eating the snakes and making the fire. So have something as a backup. Okay, survival equipment. 
I think this is more like uh, up on the, the right is more what Colonel Denisick was talking about. The things there we touched on already, uh, a multi-tool uh, that has a knife, some pliers, a screwdriver. There are collapsible uh, saws. I think they're called ring saws, but basically it's uh, got two rings on the end. It's flexible like a cable, and you can saw branches with it and so forth, and it takes up very little space. That's a good thing to have. A knife, it could be a pocket knife or something like what's shown there. Uh, fire making stuff is in the middle. There are a lot of ways you can do that. A small first aid kit, I think, is what is in the middle of the right object under where it says uh, energy bars. And we touched on water and energy bars and the first aid kit. And I don't know what that is at the bottom. It looks like paracord. So things like that will make your life a lot more pleasant and things a lot more doable if you're out in the boonies for a time waiting for rescue. And it doesn't take up a lot of space. The stuff that's here would fit really well into the pockets of a device, something like that. I love that picture up there <laughs> of Tom Hanks. Just a little planning, for planning will take make a huge difference for you. It makes you more comfortable. When you're comfortable, you can think. When you can think, you can prepare and you can take yourself uh, to a higher level. And just remember, your most important tool is your will to survive. If you don't have that, your odds go down significantly. So keep that in mind. Get well-trained, practice, inventory your, your survival items, and uh, stay sharp on it. Okay, urgent care. First aid and CPR, if you don't have it, it is a requirement for ground team. Uh, the requirement is for first aid only. It's not CPR. But virtually, as a first aid and CPR instructor trainer, I don't teach classes without CPR. I don't just do first aid. So I do first aid, CPR, and AED, automatic external defibrillator. So those are uh, important things to know. It's unlikely that you'll have an AED on board a CAP aircraft, but they're definitely a lifesaver uh, in a non-crash environment. About 60% of cash survivors or survivors are injured, but they're not dead. They just have injuries and they can be from mild to severe. But with first aid training and some basic first aid things, you can take care of uh, scratches and infections and that, that kind of thing. Maybe have some um, analgesics, in other words, uh, pain relievers in, in your first aid kit. Those help. When you have a circumstance like that, you want to, the first thing you learn in first aid and CPR is before you attempt to do a rescue, the first thing you do is assess the scene. You don't want to become a second victim because if it's only two or three of you, even four people, and one person's injured and there are three rescuers uh, or people who can give aid, and two of them get injured in the process of trying to give aid. Now, basically, it's a bad, bad situation. So be careful. Make sure you're not going to get injured first and before you're assisting somebody else. And uh, don't become a second victim. If you have a victim, don't move them unless it's necessary. And if you do, secure the head. So there are techniques you learn in your first aid CPR course on moving a person by dragging them or rolling them over and so forth called a log roll. There are a lot of things you can do with that. So take that training, you'll learn those techniques. Primary thing is airway breathing circulation, the ABCs. Clear the airway and do rescue breaths, which are commonly called mouth to mouth. Checking for the pulse to determine whether CPR is necessary. If you have bleeding, you wanna control it by applying, applying pressure and you can use any kind of cloth or material or rags. It could be part of your flight suit. It could be covering from the air. You know, with your knife, you can cut out fabric from the seat of the airplane, whatever. But then control that bleeding. Bleeding is a very serious issue. And then treat for shock and keep them warm and keep them hydrated. That's very, very important. Hydration is hugely important in a rescue scenario because if somebody's bleeding, they're losing fluid volume and it makes it harder for the heart to pump and all that. So they have to have fluid volume or hemostasis. Okay, so we covered this. Don't let them get up and walk around, even though they're saying, oh yeah, I'm fine, I can get it. 
they can only do themselves harm. So just leave them laying down. And it also helps prevent shock from occurring. Uh, protect them from the elements. Use blankets to protect from shock. And remember, a blanket over you isn't the only suggestion. Don't forget to insulate the victims or the patients with brush or whatever, but laying on the ground, it gets really cold at night. So uh, they lose a lot of body heat that way. So try to use foliage and whatnot to insulate and then put blankets over them, space blankets, tarps, whatever it happens to be to retain body heat. Administering urgent care is determine what the injuries are and get help. If you have a way to communicate uh, verbally or via text, via your cell phone, call for help. That's the first thing. Uh, in a normal scenario, in first aid, the first thing we do is call for help. Call for 911. That's the first thing you want to do is get help on the way. Know your limits, know your training, uh, and don't worry about getting sued because the Good Samaritan law will protect you. I cannot sue you for doing CPR on me and cracking a rib because there are laws to protect you. So don't worry about that. Take care of the patient. That's the primary. Particularly in the environment we're in now, bloodborne pathogens means germs and stuff that are in bodily fluids. That would be saliva, mucus, urine, feces, blood, all of that. And those can have a lot of bad juju in them. So you want to protect yourself. One of the first things you learn in a first aid class is you always use barriers, which means gloves. So those would be a good thing in your having your first aid kit. A mask, like the surgical mask you're seeing now, but as we know from COVID, you can jury rig a mask and just take off your undershirt and basically protect yourself. So go ahead and, and improvise as necessary. There are bloodborne pathogen kits, but you're not going to be carrying them in the airplane. So the best thing you can do is protect yourself with barriers. That is gloves. And if you have to do rescue breathing mouth to mouth, then you can use a lot of things to do that. You could take a baggie, put a hole in it, drape it over the person's mouth, blow in that way, it gives you some protection. There are oral airways that you can do that with. So that may be a good thing to have. Um, I happen to have a little case that normally it has a CPR mask in it and a pair of nitrile gloves. Something like that in your first aid kit would be very useful. Uh, Daryl, I wonder if you can back up to that slide of the G1000 cockpit where it asked where the ELT switch was. Uh, can anybody hazard a guess as to where that switch is? Uh, I would say the red switch in the at the um, one o'clock position or two o'clock position on the right hand panel. Yeah, right, right in the upper right hand corner. There's a red and it's a toggle switch. So you push the there we go. You push the top of that toggle switch and that turns the ELT on. Uh, and so it it will transmit. Uh, your position via its own internal GPS, and uh, also it has a uh, homing beacon so people can home in on it there. And uh, once you turn it on, uh, you can't turn it off with that switch. Uh, you have to actually get back in the uh, fuselage cone behind the uh, baggage compartment to access the ELT and uh, turn it off. And uh, it's a similar looking switch on the uh, classic airplanes as well.